Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey everybody, welcome back to another awesome episode of For the Love of Money. And today we are sitting down with famous leadership expert, Steve Farber. Not only is he a leadership expert, but you also probably know of him as the author of The Radical Leap, The Radical Edge, and Greater Than Yourself, three of some of the best leadership books that we can get our hands on today. So we sit down and we go through things like, what makes a good leader? I mean, what is that definitive answer and what does it look like? to truly be a good leader. We also talk about how to take feedback from your employees and your customers and your fans without taking it personally. We get into what role generosity plays in both leadership and success. And we even answer the question that I seem to get the most lately. And that is whose message is right these days? The Gary V version of work, 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 and then work some more to succeed? Or the other side of the coin that you hear, such as just get into flow and aim for that four-hour work week. You're going to love the answer to that. So make sure you stick with us all the way to the end because everything you've ever wondered about leadership is going to be answered today. All right, Steve, my man, I'm so excited to have you on. How you been? Thanks, Chris. I've been looking forward to it. Me too. You have so much to offer, especially in the world of leadership. I mean, everybody just heard the intro. I can't wait to dive into these questions. So before we get into the leadership questions, I feel like it's always great if the audience gets a chance to really know you. So get kind of paint a picture for us. What's your background and how did you end up as this leadership expert today? Yeah, you know, it was not, <laughs> it was not a linear process, I have to say, because, you know, I started out um, early on in my, in my adulthood, I was going to be a musician. I was going to be a guitar player. I was going to be a singer-songwriter, as we call it nowadays. Uh, I also started a family really young and and soon came to discover that that being a musician and feeding people seemed to be mutually (laughs) exclusive ideas. (laughs) So I uh, I gave up the music, and I, I just went and I looked for a job. And I had a friend who was in the commodities futures business which is a very you know, highly speculative form of investing. And, uh, and he offered to show me the ropes, and I ended up within a few years having my own shop. So I discovered I was an entrepreneur, much to my own surprise. Uh, I had my own company. Um, we were, in the, again, in the commodities futures business. And uh, the only problem was I hated it. It's a very weird place to be, Chris. I don't know if you've ever been there. I have. Back when I was in corporate America, I was... I literally know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, the difference is in corporate America, you are working for somebody else. In this case, I had my own company and I hated it. Ouch. And that is a very um, unhealthy place to be. And, and the reason was I had, I had a moral dilemma with the industry. It's Like I said, it's a speculative investment, which is just a kind of a polite way of saying uh, people are likely to lose their money. So, you know, I cared about my clients, I had good relationships with them, and they would get blown out of the water time after time, even though they fully knew that was likely going to happen, it didn't make it any, any better for me. So I made a decision to get out. And, and what I realized, what, and this was, I mean, this was a long time ago, this was the late 80s. And I, um, I you know, I had this great uh, business experience. Cause you know, as an entrepreneur, I was responsible for everything from hiring to compliance, to marketing, I did television advertisements. I did the whole thing. And I, I, I realized that I loved business. I just didn't love that industry. And I also discovered that, you know, I was pretty good at communicating. I was good up in front of a room. I was good speaking to my team. Uh, and I'd always been kind of a bit of a, of a writer, so I just took my business background along with my passion for, for human beings. I put them together and I started doing, you know, training and facilitation and consulting work back in, you know, the late eighties, early nineties. And over the years, I just got more and more focused on leadership because I saw that this was, this was the deciding factor in every business, regardless of what the industry was. 
Uh, the quality of the leadership would determine the quality of the success, the quality and the success that a company had. And I had some amazing mentors along the way. And just over time, I developed my own point of view. And, uh, and that is the extremely short version, which brings me to, uh, to where I am today. I'm passionate about leadership. I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of human beings and the human condition. And I see it as my mission on this planet to help people really grow into their own, what I've come to call extreme leadership. That's awesome. You mentioned that you had a couple of mentors. I'm a huge fan of having a mentor at all times. Who were some of these really influential mentors of yours? Probably the most famous is a guy named Tom Peters. Mm -hmm. So your listeners who are, I'm going to say, 45 years old and up that have a business background probably know who Tom is. He is arguably the most influential uh, management thinker of our day. Uh, his, his original claim to fame was a book called In Search of Excellence. And I was vice president of Tom's company for six and a half years in the 90s. And so he was a significant mentor. Jim Kuzis, uh, who was the co-author with Barry Posner of The Leadership Challenge, uh, was actually the president of the Tom Peters company, is probably my most significant mentor in terms of uh, informing my point of view on leadership and how I look at the, the leadership world. And then also a fellow named Terry Pierce, who is by many accounts, uh, one of the finest executive coaches on the planet. And these guys, they're, they're all, you know, kind of older, older. Well, they, I think they all fall in the category of old white male. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so out of, the, out of these mentors, was there one moment, was there one piece of advice? Was, was there one turning point that one of these gentlemen gave to you? Yes, as a matter of fact, there was. So Terry Pierce um, is the, uh, actually there were several, but this one, it, it, I mean, it honestly, it stays with me to this day, even though I think this happened in, I want to guess it was 1995, which is a long time ago. <laughs> <clears throat> so Terry Pierce is the author of a book called Leading Out Loud, which is about authentic leadership communication. I'd highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous stuff. And we developed a workshop based on that product, which is now um, taught by a company called Blessing White. But the Tom Peters company, in, in, you know, we, we developed it originally, and I was one of the first people to facilitate this workshop on authenticity. Authenticity is a big word now, but back then it was, you know, it was kind of like, what the hell is that, you know? Um, so we were doing a, a preview like a little, a little snippet, a little snapshot of the workshop to prospective clients. And I gave a preview of Leading Out Loud. And afterwards, one of the participants came up to me and he said, yeah, thanks for inviting me. He said, but I, I have some feedback for you. I said, really? Uh, okay, um, that's, that, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so well, what, what is it? He said, well, he said, I, I really don't think you were modeling what it was that you were teaching. Oh, which is pretty tough feedback when what you're teaching is authenticity. Yeah. Right? So I said, really? I was really shocked. I said, what? what? Can, can you be more specific? Can you help me understand what you mean? He said, yeah, well, you know, you're using the slides. We're really, you know, really kind of fluent with the slides. And, and every word that came out of your mouth was just right, you know, and you had that resonant voice and all that. He said, it was really good, but, you know, I, I, and I enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so... I was, I mean, I didn't know what to do with that. It was really devastating. So Terry, the developer of the program, right, the author of the book on authenticity, my coach and mentor was not there. So as soon as I got home, I called him. This was the days before cell phones, right, when I called him immediately. And I said, I told him what happened. I said, so I, what, what do I do with this? And he said, okay, look, first of all, understand you, you're not, you're never going to connect with everybody. Right? You can't connect with all people all the time. Mm -hmm. So just come to terms with that. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, good. I could do, you know, it's like a, you know, kind of letting me off the hook, right? Mm -hmm. And then he said, uh, number two, however, is this assume he was right and go from there. Oh. And I'm telling you, Chris, I'm not exaggerating when I say those words changed everything for me. Did it cause you to look deep within? Oh, absolutely. Every moment, every moment. So now, you know, I, I, I do a lot of speaking, as you know, and every now and again, even though I may be giving the same speech that I've given to a hundred other companies, 
if I find myself uh, uh, being distant from my own words, do you ever have that experience where you realize you've been talking for the last few minutes? Yeah, and, absolutely. But you, but you just kind of went away. You're not fully tuned uh, in. Yeah, that's not authentic, right? So, so I kind of have this 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 constant check on: Am I really right now in the moment? speaking from my heart, being fully present with whomever I'm speaking to, whether it's an individual or an audience, right? So those words kind of put me on that track. But the other thing was, whenever I get any kind of feedback, even if I know it's wrong, even if I have, you know, clinical, rational evidence that they're wrong, I still try to assume that they're right for a moment and see where that takes me. It's incredible because it's going to force you to look at a perspective that you otherwise wouldn't look at. And even like you said, if they end up being wrong, at least you investigated it. Exactly. Exactly. And it's it's always going to open up some new, some new avenues of exploration at the very least. And sometimes, you know, uh, I'm the first to admit it. Uh, when I think they're wrong, I'm wrong. (laughs) That's, that's crazy. That's, that's spot on. So let me ask you this then. Um, when, when you had this moment and he calls you out for a lack of authenticity while you're up there teaching authenticity, yeah. did you, did you want to lash out? Did you want to defend yourself? Was it hard to accept that and, and, and kind of play it off or did you turn to love immediately? Um, no, I can't, I, you know, I wish I could tell you that I was just fully open and accepting of their feedback in the moment and say, Oh, thank you so much for that. This is very valuable to me, <laughs> but no, I, I, I didn't. I can't say that I got defensive, but it, it, but it hurt. It hurt, and and I still I can still remember that kind of sickly feeling in the pit of my stomach because, my God, what if what if he's right? What if what if I am you know what if I'm faking it? What if what if I'm inauthentic? What gives me the right to teach authenticity if I come across this way to people? And and does everybody see it that way? Is it just this guy? Is it you know it's all those things that I'm sure most of us. You know, we, we go through those, those similar kind of, kind of things. But I have to say that uh, in maybe in my own, uh, you know, in my own support of myself in retrospect, I, I don't think I got defensive about it. I got, I got hurt and I got, um, I was really genuinely curious as to whether or not he was right. Wow. You know, Steve, just you sharing that story alone is going to help other people not get defensive because they're going to remember this story and they're going to say, okay, I don't like hearing it, but at least I'm open for one minute to see yeah. if this person may be right. And yeah, if, and if I'll, I'll put a qualif- for that minute, who knows what breakthroughs we'll have, right? Exactly, exactly. And just to put a qualifier on it, Chris, and in the spirit of authenticity, of course, uh, I can't say that I'm never defensive. Um, you know, I do have, you know, I do have pretty thin skin from time to time. Um, you know, authors do this kind of thing a lot. Um, it's called the, uh, you know, the the Amazon refresh. Uh, uh, kind of for reviews. Reflux. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's like you hit refresh. What's the ranking now? What's the ranking now? You know, particularly after a book comes out. And then, of course, the reviews start to come up. Yep. And I can look at the reviews on the Radical Leap, and there's, you know, 80 some reviews, and they're, and it's like, you know, four and a half stars, you know, total, lots of five star reviews and all that. And then, and then every now and then there's that one star review. Yeah, this book was a piece of crap. What a waste of time. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, what's, where do, where do I focus? <laughs> I, I, I've got the same thing with the podcast. You know, I'll, I'll go look at reviews and you, you see a negative one. And you can see 600 positive ones, one negative one. And which one do you concentrate on, right? Yeah. And then, you know, I just kind of, there's a little voice in my head that says, assume he was right and go from there and just see what happens. What a great lesson. So you just brought up the, the radical leap. Um, obviously, you've written the radical leap, the radical edge and greater than yourself. A confession, I've only read two of the three. I've read the radical leap and greater than yourself. Right. Out of the three, which one's your favorite? Or is that like picking a favorite child? Yeah, that is kind of like picking a favorite child. Uh, but I, I'll let me try to answer it with a, with a qualifier on it. So the one that I have, if you can have compassion for your own book, the one that I have compassion for is the one that you didn't read. Because that's the case with most people. They either tend to read The Radical Leap or Greater Than Yourself or both of those two. And the radical edge is like the forgotten middle child, you know? Why is that? Um, I don't, I think it's, I, you know, I'm honestly not entirely sure. Um, but uh, it's possibly because 
The Radical Leap represents the foundation of my work, which is love, energy, audacity, and proof. And Greater Than Yourself represents a very specific application of that in terms of the one-to-one relationship, mentoring, uh, coaching, if that's the right word. Um, and, and the radical edge is, is a little more, it's a little more tactical, but I'll tell you anecdotally, the people that have read all three books, many of them actually like edge the best. Hmm. So I don't know. I, I, I love them all for different reasons. Um, the radical leap has, is really the foundation of my work. So I, I do have, and it was my first book. Um, and it's probably the biggest seller of the three It's probably sold a couple hundred thousand copies by now. And, and I, um, you know, I just, I work with that material all the time, but then greater than yourself is, is, uh, it's really about, um, this, this idea that the greatest leaders become the greatest leaders by making others greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. It's so much in tune, I think with, with the theme of your podcast and, and it's, it's this idea that, that the way you become the greatest is not by focusing the attention on your own greatness, but by investing yourself in other people in order to lift them up. And I think that book was released a little bit before its time, uh, but it's an idea whose time has come. I would say it's so applicable to the way that I see leadership styles thriving today. Yes. So, well, you know, when it came out, it came out in 2009 when the world was crumbling around us, economically speaking, mm -hmm. at least that's the way most people felt. Mm -hmm. People were losing their jobs, losing their homes. And, you know, it, it was just, it was, uh, it was a tough time. And then I came out with a book that said, you should help people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure the climate was exactly right. I mean, it's still done fairly well. And, you know, Random House, who publishes it, went through three reorgs during the time the book was launching. So it, it didn't, it had like quicksand under its feet. Wow. Uh, but now I think people, people are resonating so deeply with that message and with that practice that it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's due for a resurgence. So let's talk about that real quick. Um, leadership and generosity. What's the tie and, and how do they go together? Yeah, it's significant. It's significant. Um, so let me give a little, just a little bit of context to, to my response to that. Um, we have come to uh, use the word leadership in a very uh, empty sort of a way. Uh, it's kind of lost its meaning. And the way a lot of people use the word leadership is, is by equating it with position, of, with, with, position with, with title, with authority, et cetera. And leadership has got nothing to do with your position. It's got nothing to do with your title. Um, so the conventional wisdom has told us, our conditioning has told us, that in order to reach that level, that position, that title of leadership, whether it's executive or political leader or CEO or whatever, you, the way you get there is by watching out for yourself, right? Looking out for yourself, uh, it's an ego-driven kind of a thing. Uh, it's not personal, it's just business, you know, is one of the adages that we've been, that we've been taught, you know, mm -hmm. culturally over the years. And there's this whole kind of myth that says that, that the way you get ahead is by, is by holding on to what you got, stepping on other people, climbing the proverbial ladder at the expense of the human beings around you, and it's all okay as long as you get to the top. And that is just unmitigated, is a technical term, but it's unmitigated bullshit. <laughs> uh, it is. It, the, this, the, what I've seen, and this is the essence of, of, of Greater Than Yourself, is what I've seen throughout the, the last you know, 25 plus years of working with all these companies and all these avenues, is that the greatest leaders are the ones who invest themselves in other people's success. There's a generosity of spirit. Uh, so there's not only a generosity of, of, of attitude, right? A generosity of, of approach, but there is a literal generosity in what they give. They give their contacts, they give their connections, they give their coaching, they give their time to other people who they, who they believe in, who they trust, who they love, 
uh, whose success they want to see. And, and they do it because they do it just because it's the right thing to do. They do it because they want to. They don't do it for the quid pro quo. They don't do it with any expectation of, of a return. They do it because it's the right thing to do. And what happens? They get this incredible reputation for being an amazing leader and their own success grows as a result. So are we in a time where if you are not a giver in terms of your leadership, you won't be successful, period, at least long term? Yeah, I think it depends on how you define success, right? Can you make money and and uh, do that, use that kind of old school, you know, kill or be killed approach? Absolutely. <laughs> we see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. We see it every day. So if you define success by how much money you're putting in your bank account, and that's all that's important to you, then sure, you can make money. Now, I believe, and I think there's evidence coming out to support this. I believe that you're making all that money in spite of that, not because of that. That, that the way to make even more money be even more successful on every level, not just monetarily, but emotionally and spiritually and all those other levels that we all know are important is, is through the act of, of a, a generous spirit. Couldn't agree more. I love that. So I've got a good friend named Seth Madison. I don't know if you've ever crossed paths with him, but he writes and speaks um, similar to you about this transition that's going on from the old style of hierarchy. So what you were just talking about um, to what he calls the new style of the hyper-connected world of networks. So kind of think inclusive leadership, uh, regardless of how long you've been at the job, you've got valuable input, you know, no matter what your title is kind of a thing. Yeah. And he says there's this war at work going on where we're transitioning from the old guard that you were just referring to, to this new way of inclusive leadership and generous leadership. Yes. Do you see that transition going on as well when you speak to all these companies? I do. And, and I think, you know, there's this, we have to separate out a couple of different things. There is the, the, the spirit of inclusiveness and there's the structure of inclusiveness, Right. So if, if we're transitioning from, from a top-down pyramid kind of a structure to a network kind of a structure, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of that going on. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you can have a company that, that, that adheres to a more traditional hierarchy in that you know, there's the, the primary leadership is coming from the, from the C-suite, and then you have executives and you know, directors and whatever hierarchy you have. You can have a company that's structured hierarchically or hierarchically, however you want to pronounce that, and still function in a way that's inclusive. So it's really, it's, it's about, you know, how do you, you know, making decisions that people have input on and, and all that. So I don't believe that it's, and I could be totally wrong about this, but I don't believe that it's absolutely necessary to completely burn the place down and restructure it with a you know a hyper-connected network kind of a thing um, in, in terms of how people function and report to each other. I know we're, we may be getting a little bit heady here, but, but the, the truth is that, that every organization is already networked. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are networks that are going on that have nothing to do with the hierarchy. Um, and you know my uh, my friends and colleagues uh, Alan Daly and Neville Bill Morey at, at UC San Diego uh, have done incredible work on this, and they have a way of actually going in and 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 mapping the network interactions that are happening in organizations. It's a fascinating thing to look at. Uh, so yes, in, in a word, we are transitioning into a time where we are we are more universally recognizing that. All of us make a difference in an organization. We all have an opportunity to contribute. We all want to be a part of what's going on. Uh, we don't want to just be, uh, you know, proverbial cogs in the machine, following orders day in and day out. So any organization would do it would do itself well to think about how do we more uh, fully engage people at every level. To be uh, to be involved in the decisions that we're making and the strategy that we're that we're uh, forming, and the path that we're taking with our clients, et cetera, makes perfect sense. So I'd be totally remiss if I didn't ask you the most juvenile of questions, but I have to because you are a leadership expert. What is your definition of a leader today? 
Well, I have a biased answer to that. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, I have this whole platform called Extreme Leadership. Mm -hmm. So let me say a word about that first, and then I'll, I'll do my best to answer that succinctly. <laughs> let me answer it without any efficiency first. Um, so the, the term Extreme Leadership is my way of trying to say real leadership. Because the first thing that we have to understand is that leadership today and always, I would argue, but especially today, leadership is an extreme act. It's not about your position or your title. It's not about calling yourself a leader or other people calling you a leader. It's an extreme act because it's about the act of transformation in some way or another. It's not just about getting things done, although that's important. It's not just about accomplishing objectives, although that's important. It's about changing our piece of the world for the better. That's what real leadership is. It's extreme. And that's why I call it extreme leadership. It's just my way of saying real leadership. So what does the extreme leader do? They take a radical leap day in and day out. In other words, they cultivate love, they generate energy, they inspire audacity, and they provide proof, all with the intent of changing at least their piece of the world for the better. So love, energy, audacity, and proof is, is to me, the, the, the markers of what makes for a true, authentic, i.e. extreme leader. I love it. So let's talk about the uncomfortable side of leadership then. Uh, the times that you have to stand up against the majority, but you know it's the right thing to do. Uh, the times that you might have to set a new course when it's the hardest thing you could possibly be doing at that moment. All those examples. What is, what's your advice for somebody going through that type of leadership challenge right now? Yeah. Um, you know, that's very, in, it's, it's very uh, integral to the, to the leadership experience. It's, it's a matter of degree. I think all of us are going to face that to some degree and with some frequency. There's a time where we have to stand up uh, sometimes in opposition to the status quo and sometimes alongside the status quo in order to change it into something better, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be head to head, you know, like, you know, two, two bulls charging each other in the ring, although sometimes it can be that way. So my advice is this, it, it starts with finding your own, your own center of gravity as it were. Mm -hmm. And, and that comes down to asking asking a really fundamental question. This is a question that I pose to everybody that I speak to and, and everybody that I consult with and coach and all that. The, the foundational question is, what do, you, what do you love about the work that you're doing? Uh, what, what are the values that you stand for that you really love? In other words, where is, where is your heart in all of this? Because if my heart's not in it, I'm not likely to take a stand to make things better. Mm -hmm. So we're all faced with it. And I think the, 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 biggest, um, the biggest message that I'd like people to hear in this short period of time is to understand that it's natural, to understand that it's a part of the process. And then the choice as to whether or not I take a stand, make my voice heard, be an advocate for others, other voices to be heard, whatever the context is, whether or not I do that in that moment is a choice that I'm making as to whether or not I'm going to lead. And the answer, uh, the, the answer of no, I'm not going to lead is perfectly acceptable. You know, if, if, it's, if, you're, if, if you're saying to yourself, this is not worth it for me to, to stand up, you know, uh, to, to fight this particular battle, that's perfectly fine. I just want people to do it consciously and to really understand why they're making that decision one way or the other. And a lot of times, you know, the initial reaction is not, is not the one that we really mean. Sometimes we say, no, I'm not going to fight that battle. And we, we look into it. We ask the question, why? And really the answer that we come up with is because I'm scared to. Wow. And, and, and I would suggest that that's not a good enough answer. So are you saying as long as we get connected to why we love what it is that we are doing, what we are leading through, then that can help relieve some of that discomfort and know that our path is the correct path? Yeah, I don't know that it relieves the discomfort, um, but, it, but it puts the discomfort in, in context. So this is, this is the dynamic that, uh, that I refer to as the OSM, 
which is spelled capital O, capital S, exclamation mark, capital M. That's the oh shit moment from the book. That's the oh shit moment. You've done your reading. Oh, for sure. They're great books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the OSM is is the natural indicator that we have that we're doing something, uh, that we're doing something, we're doing something significant. And the OSM, you know, that oh shit moment occurs when we're taking a risk, we're putting ourselves out there, we're doing the kind of things that we're talking about here, you know, challenging the status quo. I mean, it could happen when we're trying something new and stretching ourselves and all that. That's great. But in this context, it's all right. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's this this person that I work for, that's that's having a um, you know a, a negative effect on the people around him or her. Okay, mm-hmm. and I think I can help. I can give this person feedback at least. I can have that conversation that that to to call them out on their actions, but I haven't done it. And if I ask myself why haven't I done it, and the honest answer is because I'm scared to, then that's the reason to do it. Mm-hmm. So if the only reason you could think of to not do something is because the idea scares you, then that's the reason to do it. And a lot of times when, when we start to experience that OSM, even in the anticipation of the action, not even the action itself, we're just thinking about it, we tend to back away. Because we interpret fear as a sign that something is wrong. It's almost hardwired into us. Oh, that's scary, therefore I shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make it any more, any less uncomfortable, but at least if I can say, oh, there's that fear, there's that OSM, that means I should proceed, not retreat. It just, it reframes it, it puts it in a whole different context. And pretty soon, and this has been my experience, we end up seeking out those OSMs, and that's the ideal scenario because then we know we're always growing and we know we're always, uh, you know, striving to, to make things better. Wow, just that simple shift in perspective from running away from it to moving through it and then starting to seek it out, that's a game changer for every single listener right there. It is. It's been a game changer for me, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how simple it is and how quickly it can change things. And I think one of the reasons for that is it's, it's such a foundational human experience. I mean, love is a foundational human experience, and so is the OSM. They're just kind of different sides of the same coin. It's the love that gets us to step up and take action, and the OSM is often the experience of taking that action. And, and unless we can see it in the right context, it becomes confusing, because I love this, then why am I scared? Well, I love this. That's why I'm scared. It's just a different way of looking at it. But it's, it's, it's the one that will serve us better. I love the shift in perspective. Maybe one of the most valuable points that we've talked about up to, the, up to this moment right here. So speak t- just for one moment to all the solopreneurs out there. You know, obviously, there's millions of them right now. It's a very hot thing to be. The yeah. one-man startups, you know, the influencers, we see so many of them right now. What role does leadership play in their success before they even have a team to lead? Yeah. Well, let me put this in a, in a semi-snarky sort of a way. <laughs> it plays no role if there are no other human beings that touch your business or in your life. Ah. <laughs> yes. There's no role for it to play. But there is no such thing as a truly solo solopreneur. We have customers that we're serving. We have vendors that we're relying on. We have JV partners that we're working with. We have colleagues in the industry that we rely on. We have friends. We have family. Uh, so, so we're all part of a social uh, of a social ecosystem, and therefore there are leadership opportunities. Now, it may not play out in exactly the same way as it does if I have an actual team under the same roof or, or you're reporting up to me or whatever. But it's still the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I would suggest that that our, our biggest compe- one of our biggest competitive advantages as companies, whether and, and let's take the solopreneur for a moment, is to actually to play a leadership role with your clients. Mm-hmm. If you are offering solutions that they don't even know they need until they hear it from you you know you're playing a leadership role. You're getting ahead of where their experience is today and offering them a solution uh, to, to a question they haven't even asked. That's brilliance. And that's leadership. It's just a different form of it. Um, it's because, the, because the relationship, the dynamics of the relationship is different. 
I love that. What a great answer. So let's build on that a little bit. We're, we're in an interesting time right now. On one side, we have the Gary V's of the world. Do you follow Gary V at all? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we got the Gary V's of the world saying, work harder, 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 you know, the sweatier, the better. And then on the other side, we have a lot of leaders and authors preaching, just get into flow and minimalism and four hour work weeks. Four hour work week. <laughs> Which side yeah. of the argument are you on? Yeah, I'm on both sides of the argument. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> sprint and relax, uh, sprint and relax. Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I don't mean this to sound like a, like a wimpy cop out kind of an answer, but I think it's to, to each his or her own, you know, for, for the Gary V's of the world and people that are wired that way. Yeah. This, this, the sweat equity is great. If you can be, um, if, if there's, there are other priorities in your life and you can figure out a way to be so efficient that you're only working four hours a week. Terrific. God bless you. More power to you. Uh, for me personally, I tend to vacillate between the two. Um, I, if, when I'm really passionate about something and I'm, I'm driving really hard, I'm doing a lot of speaking engagements, for example, uh, that require, you know, plane to plane, to plane, to plane. I, I thrive on it. I love it. And I can sit and watch TV, binge watch Netflix with the pros, man. <laughs> I love I that. Do that it that's with probably the pros. balance. Is that what they call balance? <laughs> Being able to sprint and relax? Yeah, it's both for me personally. So I think it's, it's about, you know, part of it is, is letting, you know, it's, it's always a, a, a bit of a dynamic struggle between what our default mode is and what we quote unquote should be doing, because I don't want to imply that your default mode is actually going to, is, will in fact serve you better. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you end up, if your default mode is just to sit around and do nothing, if you're not careful, pretty soon all you're doing is sitting around and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a certain amount of discipline and, and self, you know, motivation that comes into play. Um, but on the other hand, if you're not that 24 hour a day workaholic type and, and you shouldn't be feeling guilty for not being that way, the real question is, are you creating and accomplishing what you intend to do? And if you're not, then you need to rethink it. And that means on all levels, not just business, but, you know, in terms of, of your, your personal relationships and, and, you know, your, your, um, you know, not, not just your vocation, but your avocation, you know, all of that, however you define what's important, if you're getting closer to it, you're on the right path. If not, you may need to shape things up. You may need to get off the couch and work for 24 hours a day for two weeks. Steve, what a great answer, because that is one of the questions that people write me the most, is which one of these camps am I supposed to be following? So when you say it depends on how you're made up, you know, teach their own, and depends what season you're in, so to speak, I love that answer. Look to the proof. So, you know, I go back to Radical Leap, love, energy, audacity, and proof. Mm -hmm. Proof is the, it's the results that we're getting, it's the congruence between what we say is important and what we actually do, it's, it's you know, proving proving that we're, that we're moving in the right direction. So if the proof isn't there in the way that you're, that you're working, then, you know, change it up, go, you know, get, get off of the couch or get on the couch, depending on where you're coming from. I absolutely love it. So speaking of all the people out there, you know, making noise today, who should we be turning to and following? Who are your favorite leaders that are out there today? Well, um, do you mean my favorite leaders or do you mean the most famous leaders? Mm, let's say the best leaders to learn from and follow today. And that could include reading books about some of the past leaders, I guess. Yeah. Um, I always have a hard time with that question or a similar question. Um, because, you know, the tendency is to say, okay, let's point to, um, to a famous leader. Let's point to Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, right? There are things about those two guys that I absolutely adore. Uh, the, the generosity, the example for generosity that they're setting through their philanthropy, through having these billions of dollars and wanting to give most of it away. But I don't know them. So I can point to something that I know about them based on what I've read about them, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm always reluctant to point to this famous leader or that famous leader. Um, I think the best advice that I could get. Now there are thought leaders that I, that I really, you know, that, that I admire and you know, who come up with great ideas and all that. But, but in terms of, of, of real, you know, day-to-day -day meaningful leadership, here's what I would recommend your listeners do. Look into your own life, your own experience, 
and just sit down and reflect on this a little bit. Who are the most uh, inspirational people that you know, that you personally know or have met or have been around in your life? The people that have had an impact on you that, that makes you want to be better, want to be more of yourself, want, want to accomplish more, want to have more joy and all of that. Who are those people that do that for you? And it could be a parent, it could be a friend, it could be somebody that you worked for, it could be a colleague, um, but somebody that you have a personal connection with. And think about that person and then see if you can, if you can um, articulate what do they actually do? What are the kinds of things they say? What are the kinds of behaviors that you've seen them engage in? Uh, and, and just kind of make a little inventory and then ask yourself, you know, hold up the mirror and say, do I emulate those characteristics? Wow. What a great formula. That that's awesome. I mean, that, that's a fantastic idea in order to have a measurable way to check in and say, am I being like the people that I look up to right now? Yeah, because otherwise there, there's this, this kind of cycle that we perpetuate by looking, kind of looking out there, and I do this too, right? I'm always looking to the 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 you know the the famous leaders, the the, the extraordinary people in history. You know, I'm watching. My wife and I are watching the series on, uh, I think it's a National Geographic uh, on Einstein right now. It's called Genius. Um, you know, that those biographies, those are all they're great. They're wonderful. We can learn so much from them. But if we're not careful, it perpetuates an idea that says great leadership exists out there, outside of my personal sphere. And it does, no question about it. But it also exists within your personal sphere for the vast majority of us. And that's where we can really learn the greatest lessons. Oh, that's fantastic. Who are some of the most generous leaders, or not some of, who is one of the most generous leaders that you've seen and, and how has it affected their business? Um, again, I've, you know, I've seen this... Uh, I've seen it from people that that nobody listening would know. Mm -hmm. um, so let me let me just call let me just call out, if I may, a couple of a couple of companies Please. for people to just have a look at. Uh, and they're companies that you probably haven't heard of either because they're relatively small. You know, between you know, let's say under two hundred people. Okay. Uh, there's a company up in in Seattle, Washington, called OAC Services. They are a uh, architectural consulting firm, and they have. Uh, um, they made last year. They made it to number fourteen on the hundred best companies to work for list. Wow. Uh, and this year they are in the top three. And they'll find out here shortly whether they're number one, two, or three. But they're in the top three. And I know them very well because they've been, uh, you know, full full disclosure and disclaimer. They've been taking the principles of the radical leap and applying it to their company mm -hmm. for the last year and a half. And that's a plays a huge. It's a huge factor in why they've been able to accomplish what they've accomplished. And they are, what they're, what they're doing is they're inculcating in their culture a spirit of generosity that says, we love the people that work for us. We want, we want this to be a place that people love working. That's why you know, being named to the list was such a huge accomplishment for them because that's what they want. They want to be known as the place that people want to work. Uh, and, and they're also, you know, they're, everything from the way they hire to the way they make decisions together, uh, is, is really, it, it, it it's a, 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 an operationalization of love and generosity. Mm. And it sounds a bit of, like a bit of a oxymoron to say operationalized love, but, but it's, <laughs> it's really not, it's not. The question is, you know, it's not just having love, it's how do I show it? What does it look like? How, how does it change the way we operate? Um, so that's, that, that's one great example. Another, I'll, I'll just name one other, um, a company called Trailer Bridge down in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, they're a shipping logistics company. Uh, they came out of bankruptcy, went through th three CEOs in four years, really in survival mode, and completely changed their culture to be more love-oriented. And same kind of a thing, very similar to OAC in that they, they took these ideas and they, they began to ask the really tough questions like, what should this look like in the way that we work? And they also had just found out that they, they made it to the, uh, on the 100 best places to work list uh, in Jacksonville. 
Wow. Um, and, and had two of their most profitable years in the history of the company one year after another by virtue of, 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 of applying the principles that you and I have been talking about here for the last hour or so. Incredible. Incredible. Hey, Lou, when you see companies su- succeeding like that, applying those principles, I mean, that's a no-brainer. you got to follow suit. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, would, I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, you know, that's, uh, this is the way that I look at it. You know, given, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, Chris, that you've had this experience in, in the corporate world before about, you know, let's just say not, not being thrilled with your work. Mm-hmm. And I had the experience with my own company way back when. Um, but uh, here's, here's what I think. My work and other people that do similar work, I would put you in that same category. Uh, I think this is what we're all about. Here, here, here's the way I, I, I've been describing it to people lately. When you're talking to somebody, a uh, friend, for example, and they're telling you about their work. And you hear the, the, the litany of, you know, my boss is an idiot. These people are, so, these people are morons and the, and, the, and the company just really sucks. And I, but, I, you know, I need the money, so I'm there. And, you know, we listen to that kind of a thing. We've all heard that tirade. Mm-hmm. And we, we listen to it with compassion. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we, we see what we can do to help find that person another job or give them encouragement to hang in there, whatever. But what we don't respond with is surprise. We never say, what? Are you kidding? At work? No. <laughs> because we, it's the norm. We expect it. On the other hand, if you're talking to a friend and you hear all different scenario, and what you hear is, you know, I, I can't wait till Monday. <laughs> I, love, I love my team. We're doing such great work. We're having an impact on the world. Uh, you know, I, I, I work there, you know, till, till midnight, you know, burning the midnight oil because I love it so much. That's when we react with surprise. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Well, that shouldn't be amazing. No. That should be the norm. So this, this idea that says, you know, the corporate world sucks, and therefore, in order to have fulfillment, you have to be an entrepreneur. I get where it comes from, but I also don't buy it. Because let's just acknowledge, not everybody is wired to be an entrepreneur. Agreed. So what does that mean? That everybody that has to go to work somewhere else is just basically screwed? <laughs> it's not fair. It's not right. We should be changing the nature of what it means to go to work, wherever it is. Work should be a place where we're bringing ourselves wholeheartedly to bear on doing really cool stuff. And even if I'm doing mundane work, even if I'm, you know, quote unquote, lower level, if I love the people that I'm working with and we're doing some great things and we have great values that we stand for, then, then it could be a joyful experience, and that's what it should be. We're spending so much of our time at work. Why shouldn't that be a joyful experience? Yes, that, is, that right there is a great answer to leadership, changing the way your employees feel about coming to work. Absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. You talked about you and me. I, I, I want to turn the spotlight on you for a minute. How has giving your generosity played a role in your epic, epic rise to the top as an expert in this field of leadership? In every single conceivable way. Um, I don't even know where to start with that. It was a great question. Um, I think if you, if you talk to anybody that knows me, uh, they would describe me, and I'm just being objective here. I'm not, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I think it's objectively, they would describe me as being, as being a giving, generous person. Um, and there's a reason that they would describe me that way because I'm a giving, generous person. <laughs> That's not tooting your own horn, by the way, is being it's, honest. It's answering it, the question. I'm being, I'm being, I am being honest. I will, my natural impulse is to try to figure out a way to help. That doesn't mean that I always can, and, and frankly, it doesn't mean that I always will. But, but that's, my, that's my default mode. And I, um, you know, what, what it looks like, the way it translates is that when I need help, I can get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, there's any number of places that I can turn to get the help that I need because people know that I'm not in this, in this world for myself alone, for myself alone. I, mean, I am in valuable. it for myself. That's valuable. When you've given help so much that you know you've got that, um, I don't know what word to use, but that those assets built up where you know that you can then turn to them for help one day. 
Yeah, it's uh, and and the the nuance to this is that that's not the reason to be generous in giving. Nope. In other words, if people get the sense, it's, it's that quid pro quo that we talked about earlier. If people get the sense that I'm helping you because you know there's that Godfather thing. One day there shall come a day where I will need a favor in return. It's a good impression. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good impression, but it, uh, but yeah. So so it's not it's not because I want to get help from you later on, but it just it'll just be that way, and and that's just that's just one that's just one that's just one reason. Oh, uh, it's one way it shows up, but it's 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 a big one. Totally agree. I've got two signature questions I always ask, um, but before I ask them, where can we find you and, and what's the next exciting thing for you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, SteveFarber.com is where I live. Uh, online. I mean, I'm also on Facebook at Steve Farber, Twitter, Steve Farber, LinkedIn, Steve Farber. There's a bit of a pattern there. Um, so if you can remember my name, you can find me really easily. If you Google me, you'll find me really easily. Uh, but the website has got some great resources on it. There's a free audio series that I offer. Um, there's uh, a number of, uh, number of videos on there. Um, you can see a whole kind of laying out of extreme leadership. Uh, I post a lot of really good content on the blog. Um, I'm writing a column on Inc.com, uh, so I'm, I'm out there quite a bit. What I'm working on, what's coming up next, is here in San Diego, uh, August 16th, is the Extreme Leadership Workshop in San Diego. It is, and I know I'm biased when I say this, a phenomenal workshop. And basically what we do throughout the course of the day is we really delve into the elements of leap, love, energy, audacity, and proof, and then we're applying those, those ideas, those principles to whatever you're working on right now. So to your, if you're a solopreneur, to that venture, if you're an entrepreneur, to your business, if you're an executive or you're working for a company, to your, to your team, to your company, to, it doesn't matter what the context is. We've had educators that have come through this. We've had entrepreneurs. We've had consultants. We've had presidents of companies. Doesn't matter. All are welcome. Uh, we're going to build your action plan throughout the course of the day. So you're walking out of there with really concrete steps. Um, I don't know if this is a mixed metaphor, but concrete steps to take your radical leap. <laughs> that is, that event sounds awesome. <laughs> it is. It's amazing. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's 397 for the day and we even feed you. And we get, we get a great, we just get great people there. SteveFarber.com, you can find it. There's a tab that says workshops and training. And then one other thing. If you want to go even deeper, we offer a certification process that continues for another three days. So some people just come for the workshop on the 16th, and then others stay all the way through the 19th, uh, where we're going in depth. You're actually learning how to facilitate the Extreme Leadership Workshop. You get licensed and certified to teach that workshop yourself, should you choose to do that. Uh, but some people take it just, just to go even deeper for their own development. Then it all wraps up with a... Uh, with a barbecue celebration at our home here in San Diego, or what has come to be known as the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> when a barbecue has become to be, you know, have its own nickname, that's when you know it's worth showing up to. That's right, exactly. And you know, I've had people actually call the office and say, "Hey, uh, when's that program with the barbecue coming up? I want to go to the barbecue." Oh my god! So that's awesome. yeah, it's fun. It's not the whole purpose for doing it, although sometimes I think that's why we did it. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna have to check my calendar because that that event sounds really really cool. I'd yeah, love to have you there. So two signature questions. Um, I'm a real big in tying that common thread of generosity with success. Yeah. And so I put every one of my guests on the spot and I say, even if it's uncomfortable, everyone has to do it. It's good natured. What is one of your favorite moments of giving that you can remember being a part of? Hmm. Um, you know, I'm very much involved with, uh, with a, a program here. I don't know if program is the right word. Um, in San Diego, there, there are a couple of them. Uh, one is called Oceanside Promise, which is uh, the Oceanside Unified School District. Uh, the superintendent, uh, Dwayne Coleman, started this initiative uh, to put every, to make sure that every child that goes to the Oceanside Unified School District uh, will graduate career and college ready. Wow. Every, every child. Wow. Uh, career and college ready. Uh, so I'm, I'm on the board of that foundation. 
um, that, that we set up in order to support that. And, and just, just being associated with that endeavor uh, is this generosity at its, at its purest. Because what, what we're saying is that no obstacle should keep a child from going on to college if they choose to go to college. So that means that the, the charter of the Oceanside Promise Foundation is to raise enough money so that if, if, a, if a child from a low-income family wants to go to college and just can't afford it, we'll make sure they get the funds. If a child isn't learning because their family doesn't have enough money to buy breakfast and feed that child before they go to school, we're going to make sure that child gets fed. If they can't afford health care, we're going to make sure they have health care. This is what's, you know, come to be known as an audacious goal. Wow. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about that. And then, you know, also I'm, I'm involved in, it just so happens to be in the same neighborhood, the Community Alliance for Youth Success, we're, we're based in Oceanside. It was started by uh, Bobby DePorter from Quantum Learning Network and uh, uh, Stedman Graham, who's a you know, famous guy in his own right. Um, uh, many people know him as Oprah's guy, you know, uh, wonderful. Main yeah. Main squeeze. He's, he's a, he's a brilliant guy and a wonderful guy. And I've been working with him uh, for three years and it's, uh, again, it's about, um, lifting our youth up and make sure they have everything they need to be successful. So we've done some events here in San Diego and just see these kids get up and, and, uh, and express themselves and talk about their, goals and ambitions and do what we can to support them is just a remarkable thing. Wow. Well, good for good. you, man. Good for you. So last signature question, why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of success and the wealth that comes along with it? Well, I think, you know, we have, um, again, in part because I think uh, it's our conditioning and we're, we're unaware of it, but it's happening. We have been taught to believe that you can do one of three things. You can make money, or you can be happy, or you can try to change the world. But you can't do all three. And that's a myth. So I believe that, and this is, the, this is actually the theme of the radical edge, that, that prosperity, personal joy and meaning, and changing the world for the better are the th are all we should be pursuing all th all three of those things simultaneously. Yes. That we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. You don't have to be an ass to make to to people in order to make money. You don't have to sacrifice money for joy and you certainly don't have to be a martyr to change the world. Why not do all three of those things simultaneously? Why not strive for that? So be totally unapologetic for the money that you're making and be totally unapologetic for the joy that you're achieving in your own life and be totally unapologetic for how you're having an impact to change the world for the better again, all at the same time. Yes. I'm sitting here like rocking back and forth in my chair. I'm so excited. That's one of the best answers ever. Steve Farber, you have absolutely delivered so much generosity and, and so much incredible knowledge to all of the listeners. And I just got to give you the most heartfelt thank you. Thank you. It's really my pleasure, Chris. Anytime. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.